My name is Lauren Pear, your host of Screen Time Reset. And today, we're doing a sequel to our last show, Pioneers Navigating Uncharted Waters. Last time we spoke to a dad with his elementary age daughter. He reported getting little to no quality information from his doctor, school, or the government on the potential harms of screen time. He also noted that while screens are supposed to make parenting easier, in reality, it makes it harder, as it added yet another thing to the list of things parents have to manage and say no to. So today, we're talking to April Hale, a mom with two young boys, a parenting blogger, and a former uh, teacher to get her perspective on raising kids in the digital age. Welcome, April. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's Absolutely. good to see you. You too. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your family, um, your boys, your background, also your blog, and you have a really cool project uh, that I'd love you to tell our viewers about? Sure. Um, I'm just another mom, <laughs> another Hawaii mom. Um, I have two young boys, Marcel, who is two and a half, and Auguste, who is four and a half months old. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm both in the thick of parenting um, and very new to it because, like so many parents, I'm just kind of figuring things out as I go along. Um, I have been a teacher both here and, and abroad, mostly with the high school level. Um, so I've definitely seen screen time um, as it's played out as an issue with that teenage population, um, as, long, as, as well as with my own children who are infants. Um, so yes, I do. I do write a, a mommy blog um, called April May Mars. Uh, it's a reference to um, my mom's name and my son's name. Um, and I do typical sort of, you know, reflections on parentinghood, um, parenting fail sort of stuff. But I also really enjoy um, interviewing other people kind of in the parenting space. Um, and one of my favorite side projects is a little group called Baby Love Ambassadors. Mm -hmm. So um, we basically, it's a group of, of parents of young children who meet regularly at nursing homes um, across Oahu to interact with the kupuna and just meet other parents um, and have these moments of intergenerational connection. So I love always that. looking for more members. Um, so yeah. I would definitely encourage people to, to check out Baby Love Ambassadors um, online. I think it's so cool to bring kids with, with the kapuna, with, with grandparents and the older generation. It lights up the older generation. And then I imagine when you get a bunch of the kids together, it also gives parents a little relief. Yeah, it's a really sweet experience. Um, I think that those sort of bookend populations have a lot in common of living in the moment and... And wanting um, a lot of touch and connection. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that warm, in-the-moment connection. So, um, yeah, I've been yeah. Uh, privileged to, to have those experiences. And I would also sure recommend others. people checking out your blog. April's a really great writer. She's... <laughs> I, I read it and that's, I enjoy it That's very it generous lot, of you. It's no, mostly it's very <laughs> sort of sleep-deprived rambling, but thank you. <laughs> Agreed. To disagree. <laughs> but um, so jumping into it, I, from what I've observed talking to parents, it, it seems to me like on the issue of screen time, there really isn't a, an organized or structured um, method of getting this information mm -hmm. to parents. Mm -hmm. And so on my last show, I, I asked the dad, and I'm just curious to get your perspective, uh, has your pediatrician brought up um, the potential harmful effects of screens? I have pretty much had the same experience as the, the father you talked to in that, um, no, I mean, my I, I just saw my pediatrician yesterday and I didn't think to ask him about it either because I think just as a culture, we don't really consider screen time a health issue at this mm -hmm. point. Um, it feels like just another sort of parenting decision in the vein of like, how do you potty train your child? How do you sleep train your child? Um, what kind of like toys get to, do they get to play with? Um, it feels like more of one of those, you know, typical parenting issues that everybody deals with and not so much a health issue. Um, so I, I should have asked my pediatrician about it. I'd be interested to hear his thoughts, but it doesn't seem like that's a, um, an, a assumed to be a part of the conversation. Or a, certainly a priority. Right. Yeah. And what about, have you seen anything coming out from like the government, the CDC, a Department of Health, any government agency? I can think of. Yeah. And your kids are too young to be in school. 
right? Uh, so that, oh, my <laughs> my older son has been in childcare as soon as as soon as um, he was able. So he's been in preschool actually um, for the last mm, five six months. Okay. And, and he was in daycare prior to that. Yeah. And so in preschool, mm -hmm. have there been any uh, any discussion at the preschool, or have they given no. any information, mm -hmm. or hosted any talks? No. No. And actually, at some point, um, we. I think my husband went to pick him up, and the kids were actually, I don't know if they were watching TV, but they were maybe listening to a, a music program that was like on a screen or something. Um, so we didn't know that, you know, that was even part of the curriculum. And it's, I, I don't judge them for it. You know, it's a long school day. They're raising my child for all of those hours. So, um, you know, they do what they need to do. But um, it, it, it wasn't communicated to us that, you know, that's something that the kids would be doing. Yeah, and, and just to, to second that, I guess, I, I'm not aware of really almost any schools that do it, so it's not mm -hmm. like, it feels like your preschool is more the rule than the exception, so it's not to, right. As far as communicating to parents right. about, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've yet to hear and, yeah. of a other preschool that does give parents a rundown yeah. of this issue. If, yeah. if anybody out there um, is aware of them, please email Screen Time Reset <laughs> and... Uh, at screentimereset at gmail.com and let me know. <laughs> I've also had my son like just randomly identify characters from TV shows. Like he'll see it like on a package or like somebody's clothes. And I'm like, I don't know where you heard about that because we don't even have a TV. Like the, I know everything that he's been exposed to as far as um, screen entertainment through us. It's a short list. So I'm like, where are you getting that information right? from? Is it just preschoolers like chatting with each other? I, um, I was talking to a mom who was saying that her two-year-old could spell Disney, and it got her parents really excited because they're like, oh yeah. my god, your child can spell. <laughs> She's amazing. She can't spell. Right. But somehow she knew how to spell Disney, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, it's like, just in the ether. It just gets them. Yeah. Totally. So if you, um, if you haven't gotten any like, quality information from official sources, mm -hmm. You know, how have you figured out how to manage this? What information is it reading articles, talking to other parents? What information have you found and, and how do you use I mean, that? I guess like so much of new parenting, it's kind of looking horizontally at what other parents of children your age or slightly older are doing. Um, a lot of private conversations, but not a lot of public information or public debate on it. I mean, I have seen, and, and you've posted some great articles, um, uh, especially around uh, how Silicon Valley executives, I remember, um, are choosing kind of low-tech environments for their kids. Uh -huh. So that definitely resonated with me. Um, I definitely kind of try to pick up on those things as they, you know, appear on my social media feed or, or in um, newspapers or whatnot, but um, I don't, you know, I, I can't think of like a, a steady, reliable source of um, authoritative information on the topic. And in these private conversations that you're mm -hmm. having with other parents, what, mm -hmm. uh, what's come up? What do you guys discuss? Um, I think it's a concern and a struggle for everyone um, to kind of figure out how to manage it. I have, I have heard that um, individual children vary quite a bit yes. to the extent um, to which they are, feel that urge or that addiction. Mm -hmm. um, to screens. Um, my son has like a magnetic pull to <laughs> any sort of TV or movie. Um, but the two it, and the, a half year old. I'm right. Assuming. Yes. Yes. The, the little one, he definitely has started noticing when there's an illuminated screen and that kind of bothers me. Um, but yeah, the, the toddler for sure is just like drawn to screens. And I don't know if that's um, the result of us being pretty strict about it. Like he's, he's pretty restricted um, and limited in what he's able to watch. Um, what restrictions do you put on him and how did you come to those? He is allowed one movie per weekend and a movie if he poops on the toilet, <laughs> which is a rare and exciting occurrence. <laughs> um, I honestly am pro I'm, I'm definitely, not probably, definitely the more lax parent bet between my husband and myself. Um, my husband was raised without a TV, like his family is very, um, you know, literary and kind of old school and did a lot of reading and, um, you know, quiet time sort of activities. Um, which is wonderful, but I think I, yeah, I, you know, I had TV, I had Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers growing up, and I feel like it didn't um, turn me into an addict. Like, I don't watch TV now because I don't have time for it. Um, so probably if it were up to me, I would, I would, you know, 
say, oh, 30 minutes a day is okay, but, you know, that could also, it's a slippery slope, right? Yeah. That could turn into an hour, and because it, it's a free babysitter. I mean, it's, if I turn the TV on, my, my toddler is just enraptured for the time that it's there, you know, or not TV, but, you know, Netflix or whatever. Right. Um, and, yeah, and of course, I would bit. love to have that free time, but um, thanks to my husband, I try, <laughs> be, <laughs> I try to be more disciplined. Well, that's um, and and what what sort of effects do you see when your when your son is on it, and then when it gets pulled away? Um, I mean, sometimes I wonder if prior to Disney or prior <laughs> to children's entertainment, like if kids at that age just didn't even experience like this extreme of happiness. Like when when I tell my son he's allowed to watch a movie because he's always asking, but it's like only on the weekend and only you know under certain conditions. Um, that I say yes, it's like he's like overcome by this like euphoria. It's like <laughs> he like sort of like whimpers and shit. Like he's just so like beyond oh, like over the moon beyond happy. He doesn't um, even know in, what to in, do in a way that like I could never bring that sort of happiness to him. <laughs> just the way like being his mother. So yeah, I, um, so yeah, I wonder like what did. Did kids not have that feeling before? <laughs> and what um, about when it gets taken away? It's it's a struggle. I mean, sometimes if it's like, you know, a, a movie is a pretty long time for a kid to sit and sit still. It's like an hour and a half. So sometimes it's a, he'll be he'll be ready to say goodbye after that. But other times it's, it's a fight. He's like not ready to return to, you know, reality and um, the banality of, of everyday, you know, disappointments and um you know say goodbye to the the perfect world that pixar or disney has constructed so it can be um yeah it can be a, a sort of violent shock to tear him back into the real world there was um one quote you had uh on facebook that i hunted down because i remember oh, it boy. like <laughs> really uh like had an impact on me and uh it was it had a picture of your son and then you wrote Intense focus reserved for Moana videos, followed by existential meltdown when real world fails to live up to animated rendering. That's pretty much it. And I, I yeah, I guess we all kind of had to go through that experience of, of learning that the real world is not as perfect as the, the fictional one. Um, so I, I understand, you know, why he's drawn to, to entertainment the way he is. Um, but, you know, we can't live our lives in front of screens so yeah yeah no that's true it's um I do think that I mean we all had it but it does feel like it's different with this newer yeah. generation as they have more access and then at the same time mm -hmm. I think it's most true with video games mm -hmm. but even with the animations I mean the animation is more vibrant mm -hmm. than the cartoons mm -hmm. we watched growing up right yeah. and with video games it's even more stark because it's they have this real-time information that they can tweak their game to just mm -hmm. be so good at pulling mm -hmm. you in right yeah that's one of the concerns I have about because I don't think I mean I, there are great movies and there are um, you know, when my son watches a movie, he watches it like the ten times, you know, over the uh, over two months or something, and we talk about it. You know, like we mm -hmm. don't go to the aquarium without having to go find Nemo in you know whatever fish tank. And I, I know that's true for a lot of families. Um, so yeah, he gets really into it. Um, but I do notice that the entertainment now it's like a lot faster. Mm, um, yeah, it's not sort of like the slow. Um, kind of gentle, like, entertainment, entertainment that we grew up with, like the Sesame Street and the Mr. Rogers. Definitely, um, and that, that has real implications for the attention issue. You know, we've right. seen this huge rise in ADD and ADHD, and they find that that faster pace of entertainment is yeah. connected to that. Which... Yeah, and addictive, for sure, because I, in, and I've tried to show him things that are a little bit, you know, slower. slower. Um, and he... He's bored. He's bored. He yeah. wants... He's used to a sort of a different sort of dress, yeah. sort of high. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is a perfect place for us to go yeah. to our break, and we will be right back. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. 
Aloha. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. And we're back. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, um, a lot of parents, not all, but a mm. lot, are hesitant to talk about mm. this issue. And I'm curious why you think that is. And, and, and they can mm. be hesitant even to talk about it with each other. You talked mm. about horizontal discussion, mm -hmm. but um, there are a lot of parents that don't have a lot of you know, discussion mm -hmm. with other parents? Um, I don't know that that's exactly the experience I've had. I mean, I certainly am interested, so I do bring up the issue with other parents that I know of. Um, I mean, I, I can only speak from my own experience. I don't, you know, I'm not a representative of the parenting community, but I kind of have a hunch that, um, you know, parents, we're all, especially parents of young children and people who are new at it, um, everybody's kind of in the trenches and like figuring all this stuff out as they go along, right? It's like parenting, it's like you're supposed to become an expert in all this stuff for like a month at a time and then move on to right. a new curriculum. Um, it's this crash course that you get to do once or maybe two or three times and then you move on with your life. Um, so I kind of have a feeling that, um, you know, parents don't want to judge each other too harshly. Yeah. Um, because we're all in survival mode. And, you know, if I'm out at dinner, which that's not a real possible situation, but <laughs> if hypothetically I were out at dinner and I saw, you know, other parents at a table giving um, a phone to their kid to play with, like maybe that wouldn't be my choice. But I know that though that's just one moment in that family's life and maybe not re representative of all their time. So I'm, I'm going to withhold judgment because everyone's, you know, doing the best they can, I think, for the most part. Um, yeah, I, and that, that strikes me as a reason, honestly, that it's so important to have a government stepping in mm -hmm. or a school or some outside party. Because from what I've talked to, yes, because especially for if, if parents that are more conscious about it or more mm -hmm. restrictive mm -hmm. are talking to parents who are less restrictive, mm -hmm. I know that that can be a really difficult conversation right, because the other parents to be feels judged. judgy. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's sort of just to me evidence that there does have to be an authority that is mm -hmm. explaining this to parents versus just assuming that they will um, take care of it within their own parenting circles. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think also beyond that, like, adults have very complicated issues or complicated relationships with technology and with screen time, too, um, and are figuring out how to incorporate and balance, um, you know, uh, find a healthy balance of, um, of screen time in their own lives. So yeah. it can be overwhelming to be navigating that as an adult. Um, and then also making decisions for your child. And in the midst of all that, you know, the technology is constantly changing. Um, I already feel like, you know, I'm an, I'm an aging millennial. <laughs> there, there's so many, like, apps and social media things and right. um, video games and just technologies that are just like a whole, you know, a foreign world to me. And my, when I was a high school teacher, my students never neglected to remind me of that, like, that I was an, a different generation. Like, I was... Um, you know, the starter Facebook generation, and they had moved on many times to, right. um, to other things. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, you know, akin to an adult who has, let's say, like, ish eating issues, um, then trying to educate their child about how to live a healthy, balanced lifestyle. You know? Yeah, and, and, and that brings me to kind of another question I have, which is, um, I think, very much related to what you're talking about, mm -hmm. is... It comes up in uh, a number of cases where there's sort of a disconnect, it seems, between feelings and reality when it comes to tech. So one example, mm -hmm. I was just reading a book, Wired Child by mm -hmm. Richard Fried, and he talks about how most parents will say that they think that technology brings their families closer. Really? But then there's research mm -hmm. that actually videotapes families, mm -hmm. and like it will show parents coming up on a kid and then sort of like 
backing mm. up when they realize they're like mm -hmm. engulfed in technology. Right. Mm -hmm. And certainly there's there's another book called The Big Disconnect by Catherine Stein Ardera that talks mm -hmm. about how so many young kids literally feel neglect because mm -hmm. so often when they're trying to bid for their parents' mm -hmm. attention, their parents are just looking at their right. phone. Yeah. And yet, most parents do say that they feel like it brings their families closer. And this reminds me of uh, something that you could maybe speak to, mm -hmm. too. High school students, they think that they're awesome multitaskers. Mm -hmm. Like, they can do all these different things mm -hmm. and they're killing it. Mm -hmm. But the research shows that is not true. It's mm -hmm. horribly mm -hmm. inefficient. It takes them far longer to get through their homework. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on how you address these um, kind of delusions or disconnects between how we feel mm -hmm. tech is improving our life in the backdrop of evidence to the contrary? I mean, I am surprised to hear that um, many families think technology brings them closer. I don't think that's impossible. I think there are situations, you know, watching a movie together and talking about it. Um, there are certain apps that really facilitate sharing, actually. Um, you know, I have this app, Life Cake, where it's like kind of like a family, like baby photos, where you can spam like your family members without annoying your friends um, sort of app. And, and that is, you know, it, it facilitates connection in a way. Um, but I do think that it's kind of, um, I don't know if we're being honest with ourselves if we say that tech is bringing our families closer together. Um, so I'm not sure about that point. Maybe I'd have to read a little bit more into that argument. Um, and you were saying also about the misinformation. Oh, like um, kids believing that they can multitask. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's, I definitely saw that as a teacher that, um, you know, I would be giving a lesson on, you know, French grammar or whatever, um, and students might be doing two other things at the same time. And they, um, you know, of course, it's certainly possible that it was a boring lesson and they were entertaining themselves. But a lot of them did believe that, you know, that they could they juggle got this. three yeah. things. And I, and even in college, I remember having my computer open and like checking my email while listening to the lecture. And it, it's a very natural human impulse um, when you get, get just a little bit bored to like find something that's gonna keep you entertained. Um, as far as how to combat that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think data always helps. Um, I think maybe with students who are uh, you know middle middle school or older, you could you could have them experiment a little bit on themselves. Um, that sounds weird, but you know, you could, um, I know what you, mean. you know, there, there are tests that demonstrate very clearly that like even having your, your phone on the table, um, it distracts, distracts you and yeah. it, it makes you perform poorly on, you know, uh, on a memory test or, you know, um, something of that nature than if you weren't, if you didn't have that sort of yeah. Pull on your attention. And um, the, the discussion of like the, the teacher perspective leads me, I remember like um, I posted on Facebook one time an mm -hmm. article that showed that a lot of parents, again, had this more positive view of how technology is affecting their kids, but teachers mm -hmm. had a more negative view. Mm -hmm. And so... Because right. um, it makes parenting easier and teaching harder. Right? That was what you said, and yeah. I thought that was really interesting. So could you talk just a little bit more about that? Um, it was, you know, it, it, as a teacher, it's kind of a battle that played out every day, and maybe it's because I wasn't, like, tough enough on my students, um, because, you know, you don't want to be the enforcer of, of rules, nobody, you know. Um, and you can't constantly yell at them, right? Like, I do some substitute teaching yeah. now at a variety of, of, of private schools mm -hmm. on the island, mm -hmm. none of which I'll name, mm -hmm. but it's certainly an issue I run into. Mm -hmm. They'll sort of have study hall periods and it's like no playing games on your mm -hmm. phone, but a bunch of them are playing games on their phones. Right. So you have to walk around and you, being the sort of mean person, you can't bust half of the class every 10 mm -hmm. minutes, you know, well, so you and, just try. And but. so much of the classroom work that we do now does rely on technology exactly. and does ask students to be on Google Drive or making a presentation or a video or um, you know, editing a piece of writing or That's another challenge. At some so. schools, I'm sitting behind the students. It's easier to see the computers. Mm -hmm, At others, mm -hmm. I'm in front, and I have to make loops. And you can right. tell that they're changing what's right. on their screen yeah, as course. you're coming. Yeah. Well, what are you, you're not going to, like, dive yeah. across and be like, gotcha. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, it's, so that's an interesting perspective. So, like, it makes teaching more difficult and parenting mm -hmm. easier. Mm -hmm. So teachers tend to see the, the negative. I, I also wonder, I mean, what do you think about teachers are a little bit more emotionally removed from their students, mm -hmm. right? If you're a parent giving it to your child, you might want to think it's better versus teachers are a little more 
maybe dispassionate about, not that they don't care about mm -hmm, their mm -hmm. kids, but what do you think about that? Um, I, I don't know. I can, you know, my experience as a parent and as a teacher are very different because mm -hmm. they're very different populations. I can, I can imagine that parents drop their kids off at school and think, okay, during these, you know, six or eight hours or whatever, my student is, or my child is at school, they're getting an education, they're socializing, they're like, this is like all the stuff that's good for them. And they don't see what teachers see, which is during the break, um, you know, there'll be like 20 kids in, out on the quad somewhere, Just like playing Fortnite on, right. their, um, on their computer screen. And like before class, they're not talking to each other, they're just sitting there, you know, glued to Instagram or whatever. Um, so maybe teachers have, a, you know, I mean, every adolescent has like their family life and identity and then who they are um, beyond the reaches of their family. So maybe right. teachers kind of are privy to a facet of um, adolescent life that, that parents either willfully ignore or, you know, just that, don't see. That makes sense. And then wrapping up, because it is that time already, amazingly, <laughs> I kind of have two questions to end on. The first is, what do you think uh, you know, should be done to better educate and support parents? Whose responsibility uh, do you think it, it primarily is? And or who's the best actor position to, to mm -hmm. educate parents, mm -hmm. I guess, regardless of whether it's you know, really their responsibility versus someone else's? And then uh, the second question is, do you have any thoughts on what might be the best things to focus on when talking about the negative mm -hmm. potential harms of screen time? I, I have this sense, like the more I've researched, the more impacts I find, and mm -hmm. I know that if I just start listing them, I'm like that Charlie Brown teacher, like wah, 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 wah. Yeah. So do you have any, yeah, any advice on? on um, well, I'm pretty sleep deprived, so I already forgot your first question, but to speak to your second one, um, I think it depends on the audience. Like parents of very small children, of infants um, or toddlers, are you know probably going to be more receptive to issues around um, sleep quality, like how how screens excite the nervous system and may, might be preventing your child from getting optimal sleep. Um, or developmental delays. Right, There's new yeah, research absolutely. coming out about that. Yeah. yeah. Whereas parents of older children and maybe those, you know, children or teenagers themselves might be more interested to know about, um, you know, how screens impede our social interactions and maybe kind of stunt our social abilities. Executive function, maybe. Yeah. Um, and, and the first question, just to, to remind you, was <laughs> um, like, who do you think between oh, okay. governments, who, yeah, pediatricians, where does the responsibility school, yeah. lie? Um, I mean, I think the government has to take a stance in order for it to be treated as a, a public health issue, you know, in the same way um, that the, the, I don't know if the APA, the American um, Pediatric Association or that sort of organization, you know, I kind of think of that as um, a larger governing body kind of akin to a government uh, health organization. Um, but those sorts of kind of global reaching organizations, I think, um, yeah, have to a lot come of out with, yeah, with at least some, at the very least, some guidelines that are continually backed up with, um, with research and data. Guidelines, um, and, and don't you think it's important to list the harms? Because for the pediatricians that do bring it up, all mm -hmm. I hear is that they'll say, like, you know, the child's not supposed to have more than one hour or two hours. Yeah, versus but actually saying, why. exactly. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, of course, we're all more inclined to follow through on something if we know why and we're not just blindly listening. And especially right? when it's so convenient. Yeah. I feel like you need to have mm -hmm. a reason to deny yourself mm -hmm. that convenience and the free time that parents yeah. are so starved for. Right. I have a lot of empathy for that. Parenting <laughs> looks really hard. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. But I do think schools are an extremely um, kind of fertile terrain for um, for treating those issues mm -hmm. because students are so susceptible to their peer group. Um, you know, just as parents are looking around at other parents figuring out what to do, um, children are seeing what their classmates are doing, what they're allowed to do, you know, what kind of phone they're allowed to have. And um, a lot of their self-expression and their, you know, social life now comes through social media and these apps. So, um, yeah, getting getting schools on board and and having those be kind of community discussions with with parents and families. Yeah, um, I think is is going to be super important. Great, and that is a, a perfect place to wrap up. Um, to the audience, if you have any other ideas of 
uh, how we could get this information out to parents who you think should be in charge of uh, disseminating education and support, please email screentimereset at gmail.com and let us know. Uh, thank you so much, April, again, for coming on. Uh, I would highly recommend checking out her blog, <laughs> April May Mars, and also Baby Love Ambassadors. It's a really you. great project. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time.